My name is George Mays. I am retired Army, U.S. Army, World War II veteran. I served in Korea in 1946, 47, 48, 49, and 50 in Germany. That gave me three years of overseas duty. And when I was drafted, when I become 18, at 18 I went into the Army and went to Fort Eustis, Virginia for my basic. From there I left and went to Seattle. I stayed out in Seattle approximately six weeks and ready for overseas and I had my orders and they were canceled on the simple reason is that the War Department had messed up and they left 20,000 troops overseas that we, 65 of us, had to stay at Seattle to Fort Lawton to unload the boats and so they could come home and see their friends that they didn't see for five or six or seven years, whatever the case may have been. But the War Department done this, and I don't know why, but I also found out afterwards that the government had taken all the veterans out of Europe first. These men that was in the Pacific were the last bunch to come home. I was involved with that operation. We had 20 boatloads. We unloaded them in three weeks. One boatload at 10 o'clock in the morning. The other one was approximately 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The, the amount on the boat was approximately between 7,000 and 12 to 15,000 totally. We unloaded the boats, and what I was, I was an MP guard for the intersections through the convoy that left Port of Embarkation in downtown Seattle and took them out to Fort Lawton, which was 50 miles. When the boys got out there, they all had received their mustering out pay, uh, anything else that was included to them that was the government owed them, and uh, they were approximately on their way between four to five days on their way home. And the thing of it was, when this all completed, then I had my orders, reenacted my orders to go to Korea, and then I went to Korea over there, and I went with the 6th Division, which is a red star I have here. That indicated the division I was with, with uh, 3rd Battalion, Charlie Company. We had, in the company, we had five uh, M47 tanks, plus trucks and so forth. When I was over there, it was such a mess that I knew something was going to happen in that country. And good thing that when Roosevelt had died and he uh, did it. So Harry Truman was the vice president at the time and he took over the last term of Roosevelt. Then Truman was elected for a four-year operation. When the four-year, when he took over, then the war was officially over at January 1st, 1947. That's how I became a World War II veteran. I got the medals to show for it and I'm proud of it, what I did. I am proud for what I did when I went to Germany. I was with the Big Red One, the 1st Division. The Russians had started some problems with our country, and I just happened to be there in time to help to solve the problems. Our unit, I was with a division quartermaster, which was 65 men total. We had started to do what we wanted to do, and the big order came down from higher headquarters. And we had to move the whole division to Rhine, Maine, outside of Frankfurt, to start up the air process of airlifting supplies from Rhine, Maine to Tempelhof in Germany, outside of Berlin. The thing of it was, was this problem was that the Germans couldn't get food and we could get supplies to our people. So what we did, we did the airlift, the Berlin airlift. With C-54s, which was a four-engine airplane. It was a cargo, and the thing of it was, we, I, our division, the quartermaster, went to Rhine, Maine to set up the POL to get gasoline to operate these aircraft. We went up there for seven weeks. We set up the POL so they could start flying. And when they did, 
I didn't know right off the bat what happened and who was going to load the airplanes. We found out later while we were there that the Germans still had prisoners of war in 1948. They loaded all the aircraft at Rhine Main. We had the American pilots fly the aircraft to Tempelhof. We got to Tempelhof. They took and had prisoners of war there and unloaded and distribution for the supplies of everything. That was coal, fuel, and everything else with what we'd done. But I, uh, I spent 30 months over there. I was just done my job, what I thought I did, and I, do, I think I did a good job. I have a medal that I drove a truck over there in the quartermaster. I got the medal hanging on me, and it's a driver's medal, and I drove two and a half ton, 40,000 miles without an accident. So that was produced by my company commander to the division commander and a big man from European quarters at that time. But like I said, it's, it was a fascinating thing, a job to do, and I learned more while I was in the service than I ever learned at any school that I went to. The reason why I done that was because I feel that with the people that I had met when I was in Germany, and I met them in Korea, I met uh, the company commander was a World War II vet. My first sergeant was a World War II vet, but the other ones were people replacement because a platoon sergeant that wasn't there. They they came home, but those guys stayed over there. When I got out of there, and then I went when I went to Germany, I got t uh, involvement with a lot of people, and the people was that I never knew when I went into the company. I had a squad leader, and I had a platoon sergeant. The squad leader, we got along real well. He was Spanish, he was a corporal, and what he done was that he told me, and I never asked nobody what these men done while they're in the previous service. He come out and told me that he was in the, uh, the Battle of the Bulge. They made a night jump. And when they made the night jump, the Germans were sitting there waiting for them. And I didn't ask them what or how or when or they, what time it was or anything. I don't ask questions like that because I knew what these men went through. The tragic is that he was fortunately that he didn't get killed, but he did get down and he finally got under cover and escaped from the Germans. But then they, uh, when we talked, and we were great friends from the time that I went to the company to the time I went out. But his parents came from Spain, and they went to California, and he had a winery out there. And he, the boy, uh, as his, his name was Chris Medrano, he uh, was drafted into the Army. And uh, of course, his father had to take care of the business at home. And we got along real well there. And after we got through with that uh, uh, situation, why um, I had, I was out in the work duty out in the motor pool and I had a, a section sergeant come out and ask me questions about uh, what I did and, and everything else. And he says, the platoon sergeant wants to see you in his room. And I says, what did he want to see me for? Oh, right. He wouldn't tell me. He says, well, tell you when I get there. I says, that's fine with me. And so I says, okay, what else is new? He says, well, Platoon sergeant invited me in his room. He said, sit down. I said, okay, sergeant. I said, what in the hell did I do wrong? That was my question. What in the hell did I do wrong? He says, don't worry about it, corporal. He says, sit down and I'll tell you what happened. He says, I'm going to tell you exactly. And I says, what happened? He says, I had 10 men watching you. You did? For what? What did I do wrong? Is my job efficiently? Or is it below average, or what is it? He says, well, the first part of it is, back at the home center, had five men watching you. Oh, he did? Why? Why did you have him watch me? I couldn't figure out why he did that. He says, I'm going to tell you why. He says, these five men, and I give him a little notebook, and a notebook with a pencil, and each one of them created a problem for their own section at the s different times of when I was in. And I says, what do you mean by that? He says, well, we wanted to know what your performance was. Oh, is it A or zero? He says, 
don't worry about it. I said, okay. He said, I ain't going to tell you the people's name either. I says, that's fine with me, Sergeant. So what else is new? He says, well, the other place was, was the same operation. The same operation was that I had five more men. And I says, well, what are you watching me for? He says, well, to get right down to the nitty gritty and tell you right out. He says, okay, tell me. He says, you know, he says, even when I went and he told me that he went through the Battle of the Bulge. Or the Battle of, no, it ain't the Bulge. It's, yeah, the Battle of the Bulge. He told me that uh, the reason why he done that was because he's never, never seen a man work like I do. Kept busy, constantly. And when I was on duty, I was always working on my truck. And I did, and I did what I had to do. And when a moment's notice, my truck was ready to go wherever, whenever, and 24-7. And he thanked me very much. Then he uh, uh, told me that uh, we we're going to have a formation about some medals we're going to give away. And I says, OK, what's that mean? He says, well, you'll find out tomorrow morning. So we had the formation. And after the formation, then they brought down the himself and the first sergeant, the company commander, and the division commander, and all that, and called three of us out. We got medals. and. Uh, I was one of the one. That I I was the first one to get it because I had more miles than anybody that had driven over there and without any problems. And I says, okay, what's the story about that? He says the the thing of it was, is that you drove your truck, forty thousand miles on an autobahn in Germany, without an accident. And I says, oh, that's nice. That's very nice. He said, but we also have a medal for you. We'll give it to you. And I says, okay. So I stood right there, and the company commander come out, first sergeant come out, and the division commander come out. He pinned the medal on me and shake my hand and everything else, and the total was that I was very pleasant to hear that I had a good AAA a, a mark for that company, for the first division. That's why I'm proud of the first division of this United States Army of this country. Just, just that simple. But otherwise, uh, I put 20 in the Army. I got out in 50. I went and lost my brother in Korea in uh, of August of 50. And that was another story. But I mean, I just wanted to say that uh, for my length of service and what I did, and I'm getting not the best of treatment what I need to get. Because a lot of veterans do get this bad treatments. I got a bad one, but anyhow, I'm not worrying about nothing. All I do is live every day, and I go on with my business. I'm happy with these guys I meet right here. I meet a lot of veterans still active that are World War II veterans, Korean, Vietnam, other uh, positions where they was at different times. Well, I just want to close out and say that that I was one of the last of the draftees, 20,000 of us, of World War II. That's why we were brought back into this, I understand that we were brought into the service to get the, the people out of the Pacific that fought in the war. And I'm very, very proud of it to this day, and I always will to the day I remember it very distinctly as I'm talking to you and looking into the cameras. But other than that, my military career, I enjoy it day in and day out, and I even enjoy it now with these fellows here, with the Vietnam veterans, Korean veterans, and whatever. I'm very happy for them, and I'm happy here to tell them that what I did. So that's the end of the story.